Uh, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're, on, we're going to read um, the Christmas story today. Uh, I hesitate to say that because honestly, my view of Scripture, I believe that the entire Scripture is Christmas story. Uh, from the first prophecy in the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, I believe that it is all the Christmas story. But we're going to read the Nativity. And we're going to look at this. I love to read it every year. Uh, I don't always preach on it every year, but I like to try to. Um, so I want to look today at the nativity scene, uh, the nativity story, and I want to look and see what the Bible says about it. Um, some, some of these stories that we read are in the Bible, we're so familiar with them. Uh, they become almost rote memorization, and, and we lose the ability to read them afresh. And um, As the Holy Spirit allows, I would love to read this story just fresh today and let it fall on our ears and hear how the Savior came to us. So let's read in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to take it just a bit at a time, and I want you to notice the first thing I want to look at is the humble arrival of our Savior. Look in verse number 1 through verse 7. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. Now Luke writes his account uh, about 30 years or so after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Um, Luke it, perhaps is the most meticulous gospel writer about giving dates and places and times. In the beginning uh, of uh, the book of Acts, uh, which is Luke's book number two, uh, and in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, he talks about his desire to set forth a meticulous historical account of the life of Jesus. And so we see Luke doing that here. He gives us places, he gives us times, he gives us people's name. One of the great arguments for the historicity of the Bible is its great mention of historical events and historical places. And many of these can be verified historically. I think another significant thing to think about is, does anybody know what Luke, uh, the traditional understanding of what Luke did for a living, does anybody know what that was? Now, he was a doctor. Now, I think it's very fitting that the Lord has Dr. Luke giving the most detail about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And so Luke is here reporting about uh, the way that Christ comes and the way that He has come to the world. And we see that He's come not in a way that's magnificent, not in a way that uh, seems glorious, but He has come in a way that is meek and that is humble. Now, if I were sending the Savior of the world, man, what fanfare I would send. These angels wouldn't have come to shepherds on a hillside. They would have come downtown Jerusalem. They would have rolled out the red carpet and they would have brought that baby through in a gold chariot. And we would have demanded that the city would worship Him. But that's not how God did it. That is not how God did it at all. And God chose for His Son to be born of a virgin and to be placed in obscurity, but not total obscurity because He fulfilled prophecy. He was in the city of David. Now, if you'll remember when David was born and when David lived and when he grew up, you remember he was the youngest of his brothers. Now, he was overlooked. Remember that? He was not a strong, mighty man, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so the Lord, the great King David, was called out of Bethlehem, and he was a nobody. He was overlooked. And the same way, Jesus comes and he's born in Bethlehem, and he's overlooked and he's unnoticed by many. Paul says, though, in Galatians, about Jesus coming, in Galatians 4, chapter 4, verse 4, he says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, 
to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. I want you to understand something. These are not random events. God was not up in heaven hoping that the cosmic dice would roll up the right numbers. He was not up in heaven hoping that, well, maybe everything will line up just right. And Well, you know, a, a manger in a stable is not exactly what I want, but it'll work. That's not what God was doing at all. God, we believe, is in sovereign control of all human history. God answers to no one. Nobody deals God any cards. God is the card dealer. Jesus came the way that God intended for Him to come and at the time God intended for Him to come. Paul says that when the fullness of time had come, the fullness of time, in other words, it was the right time. Previously, time was building up. Prophecies were being offered. Human history was getting to the point when Jesus would be born. How do we date if you, if you still write checks, but whenever you write a date, how do we reckon our time? We reckon our time by the arrival of Jesus Christ. B.C., that's before Christ. A.D., that's not after death because then you have about 30 years unaccounted for. That's Latin, Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. Human history, we have divided around the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, the dates are a little bit off. It's not exactly perfect, but it's pretty close. Now, the fact that Jesus came to this world is the central event of human history. God sent a Savior. God intervened. And God came to this world as a man. And this is what all human history revolves around. God timed it in such a way that He would come when He came. I want you to notice that Jesus had to come to be born in Bethlehem. If you remember in Matthew, when Herod asked the priests and the scribes, where was Jesus to be born? They said He's to be born according to Micah the prophet, Micah 5.2. He's to be born in Bethlehem. That's what God had said. So Jesus could not have been born any other place. You understand that. When God speaks, God is true. What God says must come to pass. You understand that, right? And so when God said that His Son would be born in Bethlehem, there was absolutely no other way that Jesus could come except to come to Bethlehem. You understand this. Now Jesus came to Bethlehem. Now notice this. Were Mary and Joseph, did they live in Bethlehem? Was that their hometown where they lived? No, they lived in a place called Nazareth. Now Bethlehem was Joseph's ancestral town. That's why he had to come back for this registration. But he didn't live in Bethlehem. He lived in Nazareth. They both lived in Nazareth, which was in the northern part of Galilee. Bethlehem was down in southern Judea. This was a long journey. They had to go a long way. It's probably about 90 miles they came. This is no short trek, folks, especially for a day when they're traveling on camel and what have you. But in order to get Jesus in Bethlehem to be born. Now notice this. This census, this registration that Caesar Augustus demanded, it had to be at the right time. Now the Bible tells us this, that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he will. Now Caesar Augustus' census had to occur. Now Joseph had to plan this trip. Now we don't know how he planned it, but it very well may have been. He says, well, you know, I can go on this day uh, but I, you know, I, I really, I'm really busy. I'm going to schedule it this day. It may have been that Joseph just had a meticulous schedule, but however it was, Joseph scheduled this trip at a certain time, and it was also dependent on the timing of Mary's pregnancy. You notice all these factors had to factor in to get Jesus in Bethlehem at the right time. God is not out of control. God is in control. God is in control. Now, I could go on and on and on for hours about how Jesus' coming was at the proper time. How that God had set up human history. How that God had set up uh, the, the per, pervasive Greek culture. Most everybody was speaking the same language in this day. Even these Hebrew men wrote their Gospels in Greek. Most everybody spoke Greek. It made communication easier. Uh, the roads were better. The Romans had built good roads and infrastructure, made for the spread of the gospel so much easier. We could talk about how the timing was right. We could talk about how the cultural climate in Judah was just right for the Messiah to come. 
We don't have time to go into all of those things. I want you to notice what God had said in Micah, Micah 5 2. Speaking through the prophet Micah, the Lord says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Micah prophesies that a ruler will come, be born in Bethlehem, and this ruler won't be like any other. This ruler will be from old, from ancient days. Micah is referring to someone who's going to come who's going to be ancient, who's going to be pre-existent. We know this to be Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Significant little fact about Bethlehem. It's, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word. Uh, bet, meaning house, and lechem, meaning bread. Bethlehem. Literally, Bethlehem means house of bread. Uh, you see that very importantly in the book of Ruth. Uh, when there is a famine, and they come back to Bethlehem when, in the harvest time. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus was born in the house of bread. Now, both Matthew and Luke make a lot out of Jesus' genealogy. Especially Matthew proves that Joseph, Jesus' legal but not biological father, is a descendant of who? Descendant of David. Descendant of Abraham. Jesus is not only born in Bethlehem, He's not only born at the right time, but He is born as the legal son of David and the heir to the throne of Israel. Now, Luke doesn't make clear that Mary is a virgin here, but in chapter 1, he makes that abundantly clear. Matthew 2, verse 1 and following, this tells the story of the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come here to worship him. These magi, these were Gentile men. These weren't Jewish men. They recognized that Jesus was born king. He was the rightful heir to the throne. Jesus was sent to reign. Jesus was sent to rule Jesus was sent to be the king of Israel. Now they bound Jesus up. Now notice this. The taxing had taken place. Uh, they come from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, of course, Joseph was of the lineage of David. You see, we're tracing all of these things. We're tracing biblical prophecy. We're tracing the sovereignty of God. We're tracing the lineage of David. We see the virgin birth. And now Jesus is born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Those were tight strips of cloth to keep the baby from scratching or hurting himself. They bind the baby tightly. Now, we've made a whole lot about this stable. Uh, we, you know, we've heard, well, it's a stable. They put him in a barn. Uh, and then, then some people said, well, no, it was a cave. It was probably a cave hollowed out in rocks where people would, would stable their animals. But now I want you to notice, she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. The poor old innkeeper gets a bad rap. Now, how many Christmas plays have we saw where there's this greedy innkeeper carried around a money bag and says, well, I've got this room booked up, and oh, we ain't got room for this. And you know, we, I've even heard sermons preached. Oh, there's, will you make room for Jesus, the innkeeper? We kind of stretch this outside the bounds of reality here. First off, in the ancient world, they didn't have Motel 6. This wasn't an inn in the way that we think of it. Now, when people came home, when they traveled, they would stay a lot of times with friends. They would stay with family. And now, here's most likely what happened. The inn, there's not even a mention of an innkeeper. I want you to catch that. See, see how we read these things in? Remember the wise men? How many wise men were there? Three? No. The Bible doesn't say three. But we're accustomed to seeing that because we've seen it so many times in media. So if we're not careful, we read the details back into the text. But now there, there wasn't some Motel 6 and some manager of the Motel 6 that said you can't stay here. More than likely, the inn refers to a guest room that would be built on a family member's house. More than likely, Joseph is going to his ancestral town where he has family. More than likely, the setting was they came to a home. Now this census was going on. Everybody was coming home. Now I grew up, now most of you know I'm an only child. Okay, So I had the whole place to myself. People always say, man, did you miss having siblings? Well, no. I never had any siblings. How could I miss them? And number two, I was I, I liked it just fine. I was I'm an introvert. I had the space to myself. 
But now, I'm going to drop a bomb on you. You may not know this. I've got cousins all over the place. My dad is the youngest of 11. And my mother, she's the youngest of 10. And I've got more cousins than you can shake a stick at. Every year at Christmas, until my grandmother finally passed away, my, my grandfather, my grandmother, and there was an uncle that lived at home. He was disabled. And, and, and they had a little house. It wasn't big at all. And my dad is the youngest of 11. And of course, those 11 all have kids and they all have grandkids. And you know what we do every year? We would gather at my grandmother's little house. And I'm telling you, it was not big. And you couldn't stir us with a stick. And you can imagine how hot it gets in there with all those bodies. And there'd be a tree. And buddy, I'm telling you, and we'd always draw names because there was just a million of us. And the tree would be full. And buddy, when it got time to draw those names, those kids, we were all gathered around. It was just absolute carnage. Just wrapping paper and stuff going everywhere. And now, the ladies would be in there fixing the food, getting it ready. Most of the men would say, you know what, there's no room in the inn. And they'd go outside and they'd sit around and build a fire and just talk and what have you. Now, that's a little more the setting of what happened when Jesus and His family went home to Bethlehem. More than likely, the inn refers to a guest house, a guest room on the side uh, in the back of a family house. Since there were multiple families coming home for Christmas, even though they didn't know that's what they're doing, they're coming back for a census. And here Joseph is. Now think about how slow he's moving with his very, very pregnant wife, taking it slow, and all the rest of the family is passing him up. He gets there, there's no room. You might say, well, how cruel of them to put him in a barn. And most of these ancient houses had a separate room off to the side, which was where they would keep their animals that they traveled with. Think of it like a garage. You didn't want to leave the horse that you traveled on out in the cold to freeze to death. And you'd have this little part of your house. It would be close by. And you wouldn't have to get up and go out in the cold to feed your horse or what have you. It would be really close by. And there would be a feeding trough. More than likely, the circumstances are not as cruel as we always make them out to be. It's just, we just don't see that. More than likely, what they did was they had this little lean-to here, this little part of the house, and they'd place Jesus right there in that manger. He'd be close by. They'd take care of Him. See, we make this huge, dire, horrible situation. Now still, it wasn't the best of circumstances. It was still a feeding trough. And it wasn't the guest room. But it was good enough. It wasn't the pit of despair, but it was poor. It was meager. It was humble. It wasn't where a king should be born. But that's how our Savior came. That's how our Savior came. 2 Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich... Now think about how rich He was. He was God incarnate. He was the second person of the Trinity. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He'd always lived in eternity past. He'd lived in heaven. He reigned with the Father. He prayed in John 17, Father, glorify Me with the glory that I had with You before the world was. Well, He reigned over all of heaven. He had angels at His disposal. And He made Himself nothing, as Philippians 2 tells us, and He became a slave. Made Himself of no reputation and He came to this world and He was born in a feeding trough. Now Jesus was rich, but for our sake He became poor so that you by His poverty might become rich. So that you by His poverty might become rich. See, Jesus not only came and made Himself of nothing, but he eventually He went to the cross and He made Himself sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now I want you to think about this. If Jesus, now Jesus deserved, if anybody ever deserved it, He deserved to be born in a palace. He deserved to be born in a castle. He deserved to be born in the lap of luxury. But you need to understand this. Jesus had that and far beyond in heaven. The whole point of coming to earth was not to be recognized as king. All the angels of heaven recognized Him as king. The point in coming to earth was to humble Himself, to become man, to humiliate Himself. You see, even if Jesus had been born in royal robes, if Jesus had been born in a golden bed, if He had just been lavished with praise, even that would be a step down for the God of heaven. 
and for the great God of heaven who reigns in his creator, for him to subject himself to becoming man. Doesn't matter if he's in a feeding trough or if he's in a castle. He's coming and he's demoting himself. But I want you to think about it from our benefit. For our sakes, he became poor. Why did Jesus have to become poor? I want you to think about this. If Jesus had come to a castle and if he'd come to a palace and if he'd come royal and if he'd lived in the lap of luxury, now where would we fit into salvation's plan? Where would many of us fit into that? Oh, I guess we could in some way. But Jesus didn't come to ostracize. He didn't come to isolate. He didn't come to pull rank. But He came as the lowest. He came as the humblest. He came as a slave. He came as a servant. He came as a son. And folks, let me tell you something. There's not a one of us here. There's not a one of us here who can't approach Jesus. There's not a one of us here that Jesus doesn't identify with. And there's nobody too low. There's nobody too far down that can't come to the babe in the manger and come to the foot of the cross and find a sufficient Savior. Now I want you to notice the second thing. I want you to notice the heavenly announcement of the Savior. So Jesus is born. He's swaddled up. He's placed in this feeding trough. But something happens. Now I told you I'd send a delegation of angels down to Jerusalem. Now God did send a delegation of angels, but He didn't send it to downtown Jerusalem. Verse 8, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. Now the shepherds were, were not the sort of people that would be the first people you would come to. The shepherds were men with dirty, calloused hands. Now I want you to think about this. These were men who slept out in fields with sheep. These were men who didn't smell nice. These were men who didn't look nice. Because of their occupation, they were ceremonially unclean. Shepherds, for the most part, were, would have been barred from a lot of the religious activity in Jerusalem. They were sort of the outcasts. They were doing a job which was honorable, which was nothing wrong with it. But now shepherds did have a reputation for being generally unscrupulous people too. doesn't mean that they all were. But shepherds just were not the sort of people that would be the pick to come and see the king. But now these are the people that God sends the angels to. These are the men that God comes and reveals Jesus to. Now these angels come. In the Bible, you often see these angels. They, they come to announce a major event in God's history. Uh, I want you to think about these angels for a moment. We, <clears throat> we think about the angels. And you've heard me pick on this before, and I'm going to pick on it again. Now these angels, they were not sweet little feminine cherubs coming along, prancing along in beauty and long flowing manes. Every time in Scripture, every single time without exception, Angels are presented as masculine and they're presented as warriors, oftentimes with flaming swords in their hand. The majority of times there's no mention of wings, though there are in some instances. These were flaming, fearsome men. Every time in Scripture, when you read people encountering angels, you read of people who are stricken with fear who fall on their faces. We had Christmas play at the previous church I was at, and every year I would get up and I would say this. I would just preach it. And listen, these angels were fearsome men. And every time we had the Christmas play, guess what these little angels would be? These little cute little girls, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, come out there, oh, in this day. oh my goodness. And you know, what are you going to do? Everyone wants to see the cute little girls dressed up as cute little angels, but 
I would always mind. I'd get a twitch, you know. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, you. You go to seminary and what you wind up being is a crazy person. It's always triggered by everything because it's like, well, technically, you wind up being that well, technically guy, you know, and, and nobody likes that guy. Well, technically. But the fact of the matter is, look at these shepherds. The angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord. You know what the glory of the Lord is? It's His presence. The glory of the Lord killed people in the Old Testament. Okay, and the angel of the Lord comes and the glory of the Lord shines about them and they were filled with great fear. Do you think they were looking at little five, six-year-old girls? Of course they weren't. These men were stricken to the heart. They were terrified because they were looking at the host. What does the word host mean? It means an army. That's what it means. They were looking at the Lord's army. And they said, fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Okay? And he says, in the city of David, now he's highlighting the lineage of Jesus. He says there's born a Savior, highlighting the saving work of Jesus. Don't ever think about Christmas without thinking about the cross. Because over the manger stands the shadow of a cross. Mary's even told later in the chapter that a, a knife will pierce her heart, foreshadowing that this baby is, is destined for the cross. So in the city of David, the angel says, so he's pointing out the royal lineage of Jesus. He says there's a Savior, pointing out the saving work of Jesus. Who is Christ? The word Christ literally means Messiah. Who is the Jewish Messiah who would come? And He's the Lord. That's a divine title. He's God. He's God Almighty. These angels came and they preached the Gospel to these shepherds. Now I want you to notice here, there's just one angel at this point. There's one angel of the Lord. Now I've got ahead of myself. There's one angel that's speaking this and saying, and this will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And then there was suddenly a multitude of the heavenly host. The skies lit up. Saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased. Glory to God in the highest. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon His shoulder, and His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of His government, now He's a King, and of His peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over His King to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Glory to God in the highest. Because He's worthy. Remember the angels, the the seraphim in Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So, so notice this. The angels, they're pointing up and they're pointing down. So glory to God in the highest up there. But down here on earth, peace among men with those whom He is well pleased. Now what does this mean? So the culture wants to translate this for us. Well, just at Christmas time, there's just general peace and you know we want to feel good. To each other. I mentioned I mentioned that Coke commercial a couple Sundays ago. You know, I want to give the world a smile. You know, everybody's just locked arms. Everybody's just in peace and harmony. Oh, wouldn't that be nice if the world worked that way? You see, as as, as Christians, we are pessimists now, but we're optimists in the future. <laughs> you understand this? I don't mean pessimists, but what we understand total depravity. We understand the brokenness of this world. We understand the sinfulness of this world, and we give an honest appraisal of it. But we also know that a bright, bright future is coming, and we have hope through Jesus Christ. But we're not deluded about how life works. Did Jesus come and give peace and tranquility on earth? Does the last 2,000 years show that? No. Jesus, as a matter of fact, Matthew 10 says, don't think I came to send peace on earth. I came to send a sword. Wow. Because the Gospel divides. But now this peace on earth, it's among men with whom God is well pleased. Those who are saved, those who God saves, have peace with God. That means that our sins are taken away. You see, we're, at enmi we're, we're enemies with God in our sinful state. 
These shepherds were enemies with God. We're all enemies with God because we love sin and God is righteous. But Jesus comes and He dies for our sins that we might have peace with God. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Now, the Prince of Peace is coming again and He's going to give true and lasting and eternal peace. He's going to put down all rule and all authority and all power. That day is coming. But right now, if you'll know peace, you'll know peace through the cross and through the blood of Jesus Christ who atones for your sins and reconciles you to God. These angels are preaching the gospel. Now, I want you to notice this. Finally, I want you to notice the heartfelt amazement of the Savior. Look in verse 15. And so these angels went away. The angels went away from them into heaven. And the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when He was circumcised, He was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before He was conceived in the womb. <clears throat> these shepherds were called to come and worship Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this. The Son of God. The sinless, pure, holy, eternal Son of God laid in this feeding trough. And here are these nasty, dirty, unclean, unkempt shepherds come and they bow down and they worship Jesus. This animal stall became a temple. The feeding trough became the holy place in the ark. Jesus was the very presence of God. And these shepherds became kings and priests in the presence of God. Because where God is, that's where the temple is. And Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Something was happening in that animal stall that night that wasn't happening even in the temple at Jerusalem. And where God makes His abode, that is the temple of God. Even among filthy shepherds. Paul talks about this. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. He's describing these shepherds isn't he? But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. The problem with salvation, the problem with people coming to Christ is not that they can't get high enough to be pleasing to God, it's that they won't get low enough. It's not that they can't get high enough, it's that they won't get low enough. You see, God doesn't save good people, doesn't save clean people. God doesn't want you to get your act together and come to Him. Now, He calls us to repent. He absolutely calls us to repent of our sin and to trust Jesus Christ. But folks, let me tell you something. Christ receives sinful men. He receives shepherds. And he receives people that cry out, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. He receives men that cry out and say, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Because when you acknowledge that you're a sinner, you acknowledge your separation from God, and you acknowledge your need for Jesus Christ, that is a starting place of repentance and faith. In fact, then the problem with salvation is not that men can't get high enough, it's that they won't get low enough. If you're going to come to Jesus, you're going to come without any righteousness. You're going to come stinky, and smelly, and dirty knowing that you have nothing on your own except what God supplies. And isn't it wonderful that the righteousness that God requires, God Himself supplies. Now, if you'll humble yourself, if you'll acknowledge your sinfulness, 
you'll look to Christ, you can be saved. Just like these shepherds. And notice Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise or noble or powerful. God chose what is foolish to shame the wise and God chose what is weak to shame the strong. People have interpreted this verse to make it say that God only saves, you know, poor and helpless and humble people. Now, that's, that's, that's the other way. That's the pendulum swing. Now, we don't want God saving only rich people and smart people and powerful people. But now if God only saves poor and ignorant and unlearned people, then that's the opposite problem. Notice Paul says here, not many of you. Now, what Paul's saying here, not many people, period, are noble and wise and rich and strong. God saves anyone who will trust Jesus Christ. Does it matter if you're a dirty, filthy shepherd or if you're a magi coming from the east with gold and frankincense and myrrh? If you will humble yourself and worship the babe, worship the man, worship God eternal, you will be saved. Rich or poor, noble or unnoble, wise or unwise, if you'll come to Jesus Christ acknowledging your sinfulness, you can and will be saved. Now these shepherds took off after worshiping Jesus, after seeing these things, after seeing that it was the way that God told them it would be. What did they do? They made known the saying. They told everyone. When you know Jesus Christ, you want others to know Him. It's that simple. When you know Jesus Christ, you want others to know Him. But then Mary had a different response. Notice this. She treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Mary, did you know? Did, did we sing that recently? Yeah, we did, didn't we? Yeah, it was on our song service. I like that song. I'm not going uh, to pick on it. Just, just a little bit. Just to say this. She knew. I think the song bears that out too, the way that it goes. She knew. She knew. I like the song. I genuinely do. Mary knew. Because you know what she did? She's sitting here and the angel's already told her that who he's going to be. And on down chapter 2, she's going to hear that he's destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel. And she lays this baby in a manger. And she's sitting here trying to figure this thing out. And here along come these shepherds. And they say, you know what? Host of angels, army of angels came. Told us he'd be here. We're going to come over here and worship him. And we're going to praise him. Now, let's zoom out a little bit and, and put a little flesh and skin on Mary. Mothers, you're sitting there with your child and here along comes a bunch of rapscallion shepherds and they come in and start worshiping your baby and saying, angels told us to come here, told us it'd be just the way it is, told us he'd look this way, told us it'd be this way, and uh, that's just the way it is and we're just going to worship this baby as Christ the Lord and as the Savior. And they take off and they can't shut up about it and they tell everybody in the countryside. You know what you're going to do? You're going to do like Mary. You're going to ponder these things. <laughs> And you're going to treasure them up in your heart. Hmm, I wonder what this means. Mary knew that something was different. She already knew that. That Jesus was no ordinary boy. Matthew 1.21, the angel says to Joseph, she will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. And the name Jesus means the Lord saves. That's what it literally means. It means Yahweh saves. And the reason you're going to name him that is because he will save his people from their sins. So what do we do? You need to recognize from the birth of Jesus, recognize that God is in control of all human history. He's in control of this moment right now. Recognize that God sent Jesus to save sinners. He's God's gift to this world. Recognize that this message needs to be taken to everyone Everyone needs to know this, Jesus. Share the gospel. Share Jesus Christ. If you do anything this Christmas season, if you want to be, if you want to celebrate Christmas, tell someone about Jesus. Tell them who he is. Tell them why he came. And tell them what he can do for them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's true. Father, I pray we've read the Christmas story afresh today, the nativity story. And Father, I pray that we will worship the Son, that we will know the Son, and we will make the Son of God known to others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.